Revelation 13, if you would, Revelation 13, and I'm going to make use of this over here, because really that's the, when I talk about dragons, that's really going to be the theme and the purpose of uh, studying dragons is uh, know your enemy type thing, and we know according to scripture, uh, one very important part of Bible prophecy, Revelation 13, and uh, the Bible says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Wouldn't you like to know what that is? Okay. Uh, it's, I don't know what it is. It could possibly be that he has taken the name of God himself. We know that we are warned about another Jesus. Jesus himself said, if any man uh, say, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And um, so that's what we're, we're told to look for these things. We know that in 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we, we know that the name of blasphemy is probably going to be related to him somehow, some way taking the name of God. Well, that's just my opinion of it. And then verse two, and the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. Uh, what do you think of when you think of leopards? Spots. And think of how the Bible uses that term spots. Spots and blemishes are a type of sin. What do Hindus put on their forehead as a sign that they have been illuminated? It's a dot. The, the word that they use is called a bindi, B-I-N-D-I. And that word literally means dot or spot. So their religion essentially is a religion of the Antichrist. They are the ones along with, I guess, Roman Catholics who put a mark on their forehead, they are the ones who are putting a dot or a spot or a blemish on their forehead, and they call that enlightenment. So that's the leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. That's what you've got to worry about when you run into a bear. Amen? Uh, his feet, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That lion will eat you up. And the, here it is. The dragon gave him his power... And his seat and great authority. So when we study dragons in the scriptures, we're learning about what the dragon, Satan himself, is, is doing when he is handing over his power, his seat, and his great authority. He's handing this over to the man of sin, the son of perdition. And this man of sin is going to reign over the earth, including... If you look on down here, and I don't like this verse, but I believe it. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. I don't like that, but I believe it. So apparently God is... This is not something where God is going... Man, I tried to help my saints, but I just couldn't do it. The beast was more powerful, and my saints just didn't release me. Amen. God allows the beast to make war with the saints and overcome them temporarily. Amen? Uh, that's going to be his mistake then God is going to, okay? Um, we were out shopping yesterday. There's a, there's a nice little town up north of here called Kimswick. And if you ever come to this area again, go to Kimswick. It's an old river town. Some of the buildings from the 1800s and so on. And they have all these little shops and things like that. Well, uh, Tracy noticed yesterday that they were selling a book. Now, now let, me let me give you a little background about it. I like Kimswick. And I like the river. My dad was a river man. He worked on the river. So anything related to the Mississippi River, I like. But every year in October, this whole town 
has a, has a uh, festival called Witches Night Out. And it's primarily for women, period. And you don't have to be a Wiccan. You don't have to be a card-carrying witch. You just show up over there. But it is very geared toward uh, feminine power, feminine authority, Jezebelism. I mean, the spirit of Mystery Babylon is all over that town. So some of the shops there are geared toward that. And she saw this is a children's book written by a local author. Uh, I can't remember her name. It's uh, Michelle Ashenbrenner. And the website or the back of the book says Michelle would describe herself as a dragon enthusiast. This woman, she's graduated from college and she's got a degree and everything like that. But here's this grown woman and part of her resume is that she spends a lot of time in video games. Playing probably occult-based video games. Like, I don't know, I don't know what all's out there. But she is involved in, that's what, how she spends her time involved in this virtual world of games. Anyway, she's a dragon enthusiast. Her fascination and obsession with the mythical creatures, that's where I disagree. They're not mythical, if they're real. The mythical creatures leading her, leading to inspire her first book. In 2017, Michelle published what does a dragon own launching her writing career now tracy did you where's tracy did you buy the book now why didn't she buy the book and get, give it to me and say pastor you can use this because i have people do that stuff all the time now let's go to job chapter 40. behold behemoth job chapter 40. behold behemoth and I have a picture up there of what a lot of scholars and maybe even in the margin of your Bible where it says behemoth, the margin in your Bible might say hippopotamus or rhinoceros or elephant or something like that. Okay, so we're going to read Job chapter 40 and we're going to ask ourselves, does the hippopotamus match the description of behemoth according to Job chapter 40. Verse 15. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. God is saying to Job, Job on the same day that I created behemoth, I created you. And if you go back and read Genesis Chapter 1, you can see that on day 6 of creation, God created all of the land animals, the land creatures, and He created man on that exact same day. So that's what He means by that. So when we identify behemoth, then we know from what God said that behemoth was made on the exact same day as man was, so that means man and behemoth existed in the same time span. Amen. Unless somebody goes to CERN, goes back in time, <laughs> and messes with that day six of creation. Right? Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Well, a hippopotamus eats grass like an ox. Lo now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. His area, his midriff right here is where the chief of his strength is. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Here's the hippopotamus tail. You know what a hippopotamus primarily uses his tail for? Not to swat flies. Huh? When he is defecating, he swishes his tail like that to spread it. It looks like a manure spreader. So it doesn't all come out in one clump. He goes, shh, like that. Don't ask me to do that again. 
But that's not a cedar. Okay. How about maybe that? Behemoth. Behemoth basically means he's big. Amen. Length. 23 meters. Somebody do the math on that. What is that in feet? Go to Google, type in 23 meters to feet and find out how much that is. 70 feet? Well, you're quick. Did you do that up here? Good for you. His height is uh, 65 meters. About 195 feet. I like you, Ron. He moved it. So a beast that's 195 feet tall. That's big. 40 tons. 40 tons he weighs. Okay. So he moved his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. I believe that. If he weighs 40 tons, he's got to have strong bones. His bones are like bars of iron. Think about that. Okay. What kingdom is coming? Dun, dun, dun. He is the chief of the ways of God that he that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. That means God is not afraid of Behemoth. God can come down and take a sword and cut Behemoth up, cut him in half. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw Jordan into his mouth. Now, that's not Michael Jordan. Although he could probably eat Michael Jordan. But he draws Jordan River up into his mouth, just sucks it up. And God, it seems like to me God is describing when Behemoth drinks... It looks like all the water is leaving the lake or leaving the stream. He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. Obviously, somebody tried to set traps for Behemoth and it didn't work so well. Amen? So I think that Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, or some other sort of saurus, Matches better the description of Behemoth more so than the swishy wishy tail of the hippopotamus. Can I hear you say amen? amen? So when we believe that the earth was created in six days, somewhere around 6,000 years ago, that doesn't leave 65 million years for dinosaurs to vanish and then for us to show up. That doesn't do that. It doesn't work that way. So we believe... That God created everything, all the beasts of the field and all the fowl of the air. He created them on day five and day six of his creation. They were literal days. They can be traced all the way back to Adam. We have the records in the Bible of how long Adam lived. And we can take those records then, believing what the Bible says, and figure out that we are somewhere about 6,000 years from the creation of Adam and all of these beasts. And they walked together. Now, when I did uh, the video, Mystery Creatures of the Bible, um, I kind of got into that part of it and showed that there was evidence that dinosaurs did, in fact, walk with man. In fact, there's a stream, there's a creation museum down there. Uh, Dr. Uh, what's his name? Carl, Carl Ball uh, built a museum down there because there's a river in Texas that the dry riverbed is, is bedrock and embedded into that bedrock are dinosaur footprints. Clearly, dinosaur footprints. And then, right next to it, are human footprints. In the same mud on the same day. Now, something happened to that mud to where it turned into stone almost in a day or two. Because those footprints are fairly intact. Which means water did not wash over them to wash them away. Something happened as this dinosaur and this man is running. Because they can kind of tell that they're running because of the spread of the legs. 
And something happened to where that, that mud solidified into hard rock and thus sealed in those footprints for us to look at and go, that's exactly how the Bible says it. Amen? So I just believe that stuff. Now look at Job 41, Leviathan. He's mean. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? Now Leviathan would be, the Bible teaches us, if you read this whole chapter, and we're not going to do that, but the Bible teaches us that he swims in the water. He's, he swims like a sea monster. Did you know the phrase sea monster is in the King James Bible? It's there. It's one verse, but it's there. So I believe in giants, dragons, unicorns, sea monsters. That's what the Bible says. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? You cannot catch Leviathan with your rod and reel. Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down. You cannot fish and catch a Leviathan. Canst thou put an hook into his nose? If I was fishing, that's more likely where the hook would end up. In his nose and not in his mouth. Or bore his jaw through with a thorn. Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will Leviathan ask your permission to swim where you're swimming? No. Will he speak soft words? Now, think about this. We have a beast in Revelation 13. We have a beast over here that rises up out of the sea. And we have a beast here that, according to God, is the meanest beast that God ever created. All right? So, will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? No. Job is getting this. He's not sitting there answering no, 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 no. But he gets it. He understands what God is saying. God is saying he will not speak soft words unto thee. He will not make many supplications unto thee. Verse 4. And I want you to think about this. Will Leviathan make a covenant with thee? No. So, turn to Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to throw you a curve. Daniel chapter 9. Are you Bible students? Do you know what's in Daniel chapter 9? You're fixing to. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying. He read that the Israelites are going to be in the land for 70 years. And um, who can... I need somebody to turn that camera to record. Who thinks they can do that? There's a record button on there. Thank you, brother. And make sure, it, make sure it's on me. Like in this area here, right? Am I good? You see me over here? Hit that record button. No, no, not that one. That's just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to move here and work here, I tell you that. But anyway, uh, he reads, uh, Daniel reads Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah they're going to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Daniel reads Jeremiah and says, we're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And after that, God's going to let us out. So now Daniel has hope. God's not just thrown him out forever. Now, I preached a message here a few Sundays ago about backsliding. Who remembers that? Most of us backslid. And you may have got to a place where you weren't sure if God was going to bring you back got scared. God brought Israel back. Backsliding, and he called them backsliding Israel. God brought Israel back after 70 years. God brought you back. God is the one who loves to bring the backsliders back home. Amen. So now Daniel prays and the answer to his prayer is coming. And we read here about what God is going to do in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the whole, thy holy city 
And there's seven things God's going to do in 70 weeks. A week is seven days. So he says, number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision. Number six, and prophecy. And number seven, to anoint the most holy. Seven things that God's going to do in 70 weeks, which have seven days in them. God's a God of order. Amen. He loves to follow the order. So then he says, no one there, no, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's a lot in this part of Daniel that is very hazy to me. Okay? And it's sealed. So I think there's our understanding of it is not really going to be... We're not going to really get it until it happens. But look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I, I'm, just, I'm not one that just barks at everybody and tells them how wrong they are, but I do ask questions. And I have questions. One of my questions is, who is it that confirms the covenant with many for one week? Who is it that's doing that? Some say it's the Antichrist. Some, I don't know, it could be the Messiah. It just says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. But when I look at Leviathan, the question is, will he make a covenant with thee? And the obvious answer is, no. a tyrant doesn't let the people agree to his tyranny. He rules over them and they better just do what he says. He doesn't need a constitution to give him power. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just ask questions, and that's one of the questions that I have. Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Can you train a Leviathan? No. Will thou play with him as with a bird? No. Will thou bind him for thy maidens? No. Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Can't catch him. Shall they part him among the merchants? You know, they sell fish in the markets, right? They would bring in fish, big net full, and the merchants would buy them and then sell them out in the market. Nobody ever sold a Leviathan because no one ever caught one. So God is teaching, he's reminding Job about this massively powerful beast that's in the sea. Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thine, oh, I like verse 8. Lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. If you ever decided you wanted to try to catch a Leviathan, if you lived through the ordeal, you would say, I'll never do that again. Amen? So some poor guy would come up and say, is there any Leviathans over there in that river? Yeah, why? I want to catch me one. I wouldn't. Right? You'd warn somebody, uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. So God is talking about this amazingly powerful, mean beast that can't be reasoned with. So in verse 18, by his niecings, a light doth shine. What is a niecing? I looked it up. <gasps> Shoo! A sneezing. When he sneezes... Sparks fly out of his nose. And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. You, you get that picture, right? You're looking, you can see the sun. It's about to make its first appearance over the hill. And then all of a sudden, boing! Just the very edge of that sun is peeping over the top of that hill. That's the eyelids of the morning. When he sneezes, and when his eyes blink... It looks like the sun shining. He's got 
Look at verse 19. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. He is a fire-breathing dragon. I thought those were a myth. I thought those didn't exist anywhere. God said, I made them. I think they're pretty cool. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals. I've met people like that. This weekend. <laughs> and flame goeth out of his mouth. He is a fire. Look at this. That's who he is. He is a fire sneezing, spitting. The, there's a word that the old timers, and I'm talking about way, way, way old timers used for these creatures. They called them spitfires. Why would they call them that, John? They spit fire. They, when they sneeze, goodness gracious. Great balls of fire shoot out of their face. That's what God... Now, this is not... Again, do we believe what God said in His Word? And is this, is this a myth that God is telling? Does God say to Joe, you remember those stories that your Uncle Freddie used to tell you about fire-breathing dragons? You know, he made that up. But if those were true, that would be really cool. That's not what God said. God said, think about Leviathan. You've seen him. Behemoth, you've seen him. So myth in the Bible is actually reality. Right? So God's people believe in giants, dragons, and unicorns. Psalm 74. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Sea monsters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. Now, maybe this is a stretch with me. But he said, thou breakest the heads, plural, of Leviathan, singular, in pieces. Right? Because the beast that John sees coming up out of the sea has more than a head. He's got seven of them. And there are myths about seven-headed serpents or seven-headed dragons. Or dragons with multiple heads. There are stories about those. Is it possible that those stories could be true? Well, I know of one for sure that's absolutely true. And it's in Revelation 13. Yes, and... This, the dragon, Satan, the devil, he also has seven heads. We don't think of him that way, but that's what he has. That's what Revelation 12 says he has. He has seven heads and ten horns, all right? So, thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood, thou driest up mighty rivers. Now, we know God did that part. Did God make Leviathan and did he break his head in or his heads in pieces? And I believe, yeah, absolutely. Psalm 104. So is this great and wide sea wherein are creeping things innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. So in the book of Psalms, there's David writing about ships at sea and the idea that there's sea monsters in the sea. So he says, uh, these wait all upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Now I like that because that's kind of like what Jesus said. Consider the sparrows. Does God feed the sparrows? Sure he does. According to this, does God feed his pet leviathans? Sure. And he made them to play in the sea, in the ocean. Like dolphins. Dolphins are very playful creatures. Am I right? 
They love to play. They love to jump out of the water and do things. And they love to interact with people and so on. And that's how God made these creatures. So we can see that even in things like whales and, and dolphins and things like that. We can see that God instilled in their nature and character the idea that they play in the water. These all wait upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them that thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good. Who fed the Leviathans? Who's feeding us? When we ate this morning, we bowed our heads and we asked, we told God, thank you for providing us the food. Now, I know where the gravy came from. I know where the biscuits came from. I know who put them in the oven. But God is the one who fed us. Amen? Amen? I'm trying to turn some air on. Is anybody getting a little hot, a little stuffy? All right. Let me give us a little air here. The rest of you just put a coat on or something. All right. There we go. At least get a little air moving. Uh, verse 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Why? Because they can't, they're not going to be fed. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Who's in charge of whether they live or die? God is. Who's in charge of whether you live or die? God is. And He always is. So I have been with saints who have died and gone to glory. And they thanked God in their last hours. For being there with them in their last hour. I hope that that's how it ends with me. Amen. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. Revival is always in God's hand as well. Death and life belong to God. God is the one who brings life. God is the one who brings death, and then God brings life again. Just last week, I did a funeral for, a, for an older gentleman uh, that had been coming to our church. And I think two days later, um, one of his granddaughters decided she was going to marry the boyfriend she was living with. They asked me uh, just the day before, can you marry them? I said, do they have a marriage license? Yeah, they're going to go get one. I said, well, bring it over here. And they said, well, thank you for doing that. We didn't, you know, we know we just popped this on you. And I said, look, if I preach that people should be married, then why would I not marry the ones who asked me to marry them? Right. Amen. Isaiah 27, turn there. Verse 1, in that day the Lord with his sore and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan. In that, in that day. That day is a day in the future. That God is going to do this. Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. Because what do they look like? Like snakes. They're windy and twisty. They're, the Bible term for that is crooked. And he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. What did Revelation 13 say? Where did that beast come from? Came from the sea. God's going to kill him. Amen. He killed the saints. God's going to kill him. You live by the sword. You're going to die by the sword. And that day sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. I the Lord do keep it. We're the vineyard. I will water it every moment lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in the battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with you. When you ran into God. Remember that day, John DeMano? When you ran into God and you found out that he was in fact the boss, the Lord, the King of Kings. You made an agreement with him. You made peace with him. I surrender. Amen. That was the wisest thing you've ever done. Amen. Or let me hate, take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come out of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. And my point is, we believe 
what the Bible says about God making peace with man and God's going to make Jacob to take root and blossom. But we believe that part. Literally, do we believe that there is a Leviathan, a piercing serpent, a crooked serpent that God is going to destroy? Yes. Now look up on the screen. There's a word in your Bible called a cockatrice. You ever come across that word? Now you have. What is it? Well, it's sort of like a serpent with a chicken head. I didn't make him. A serpent with a chicken head. Now, I say I didn't make him. Those who don't believe the Bible, like Bible scholars, they would look at that and say, obviously, a mythological creature that has no basis in reality. It's the fanciful imagination of people. And yet God was using that as an illustration for blah, 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 blah. Right? Rejoice not thou, whole, Pal whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root. Now, who is the serpent? Satan. Look at the language here. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Look at the language of verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who is that? That's Jesus, the son of David. He is described as the rod out of the stem, a branch out of his roots. Look back at Isaiah 14, 29, up on the screen. Because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. A rod, but it's a broken rod. Out of the serpent's root. Here in Isaiah 11, the, uh, the root, the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The stem of Jesse. See, all the language... Is here in Isaiah 11 and it's here in Isaiah 14. But it's not the stem or the root of Jesse. It's the root of the serpent. Serpent's seed. Hi, Southern Rays. Southern Rays is here. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I came in this morning, drank my coffee and walked through here. And I was going upstairs and I thought, well, when is they going to get here to put their stuff? And when I came back, it, all it was there. And I'm going, they're fast. <laughs> Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. The word cock meaning a chicken, chicken head. And his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Because the cockatrice had wings and it had the tail of a body or a tail of a, a serpent. And we know the Leviathan spit out fire out of its mouth, right? So all the scientists at one time said the cockatrice is the fanciful imagination of somebody and it ended up in the Bible and therefore the Bible is wrong because it talked about something that is a myth and it's not true and and people will latch on to things like that and that's all they need is for someone to say see that's why the Bible's wrong and they're going that's exactly what I think and they will love it that the Bible is wrong because that means they don't have to pay attention to the Bible and they can go out and sin and do whatever they want to amen Mandela effect for the same reason since somebody went back in time allegedly and changed all the words in the Bible. Now the, I don't trust the Bible anymore. Now the Bible's all messed up. And uh, I can do whatever. I can ignore it because I think it's been changed. And I can do whatever I want to. But people will come up with every reason in the world why the Bible should be wrong. But it's not. Oh, by the way. They found one. In China. The name that they gave it is Yi Qi. 
a flying reptile. The name means strange wing. A single skeleton was discovered in China and when they made the model of it, it looked exactly like what the Bible said it looked like. God was right all along. Amen? Amen? Never wrong. You can believe what God said. You can trust what God said. And I love it when the scientists find out that God was right all along. But they never admit it. They never admit it. Amen. Now I'll turn to numbers. Because when he said that uh, numbers, numbers 21, turn there. When he said that the, out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. That's what Israel encountered in the wilderness. Because they murmured and said, God must be wrong. Every time Israel murmured in the Bible, they were saying, God must be wrong. God must have been wrong for dragging us out here. God must be wrong about the claims that he made about a land flowing with milk and honey. So they sent 12 spies in and they come back and said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, all right. <laughs> but then they looked for another reason why God was wrong. They said, the sons of Anak are in there. We can't go in there. Oh, God's wrong now. Let's make us a captain and let's go back to Egypt. See, they were choosing their old slavery. Instead of believing what God said that he would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And how many of you know somebody that did that? They got in church for a while. Started digging it for a while. And then something happened. And they thought, well, I'm not going to ever go to heaven. So they started in their mind thinking, maybe I'll just go back to the old days and the old ways and look up the old gang and get out the old drugs and the old whiskey and the old porn and the old gals that I used to run with and let's get all that stuff out and let's go do that again. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to the bondage we were in. See, I know people like that and so do you. It's like every time you get them halfway out of Egypt, they just stop and turn around and go back. Pray for them. Maybe, maybe one time, God will help them make it through. How are you, how are you going to get to the promised land? Same way they are. Same God, same promise, same hope. So they're in the wilderness and they're murmuring against God again. So Numbers 21, verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Have you ever been there before? Much discouraged because of the way that God was leading you. And uh, the people spake against God and against Moses. Moses being the mediator. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Have you ever been there before? Have you ever said that before? I have. I have. God, why did you lead me this far just to hang me? You could have hung me back where I was. So, for there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. They were talking about the manna. And the Lord sent what? These are not just regular serpents. Fiery serpents. Spitfires. The word serpent and dragon can be interchangeable in the Bible because serpent then refers to any sort of reptile creature. Whether it has legs or it doesn't have legs, that's what it's referring to. So, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. So then, verse, let's see here. Verse uh, 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. You see, 
You're going to, while you're out in the wilderness wanting to turn away from God, you see how God, you pay attention to how God is judging other people for what they do. And that ought to wake you up to say, I don't want that to happen to me. The serpent got them. You see, the, where does the serpent's poison come from? The poison is the words that these people are choosing to believe. And if they're not God's word, they're lies and they're poison. And people would rather believe the poison than they would God's truth out of His word. That's why this room is not full. And probably never will be. Because there's very few people now who want to choose the truth but there's a lot of people that go for the poison. So the rest of them saw that and they said, I don't want that to happen to me. I've been there. I've been there. I watched what God did to others and I said, God, please, don't let that be me. Amen. Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Look and live. That's the gospel of grace through faith. Because Moses did, and, and Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole. Brass then represents fire. Brass looks like fire, doesn't it? Same kind of same color. So when you see brass in the Bible, think fire. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and, came to, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That's good. Amen. See, that is you believing. Now, if they don't believe God, God, that's stupid. How is it that I can just look at that and live? God, that's the stupidest thing. That, but that's what God said. If God would have told you to dance in a circle 21 times and close your eyes and stand on your head for five minutes, you would have tried it. Why don't you just look and see what happens? It's that simple. So you, this is the gospel of grace through faith. It is God's grace, but it is their faith because they had to believe what God said so that they would look at the serpent. And... Now, here's why I'm saying this. Were there really fiery flying serpents? If there weren't, Jesus lied. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Did Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness? Were there fiery flying serpents? If there weren't, Jesus lied to us. Think about it. Think about that. Isn't this neat? You thought we were just going to talk about dragons. And some people say, well, I don't, we, that's not going to help us in life. Why not? Why don't you just believe God in simple faith and look and live? That'll help you in life. That'll help you when things are not going well in your life. That'll help you when you get backslid in sin. That'll help you when things are not right in your marriage. That'll help you when things are not right in your home or at work or your finances or whatever issue of life there is. Why don't you just look and live? He said, I came to give you life and that you might have it more abundantly. More abundantly than everybody else is having it because they're trying to figure out a way to get back to Egypt. But you, you believe in the cross because that is... As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so should the Son of Man be lifted up. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Somebody say amen. Oh, come on. It's okay for you to do this every now and then. You're going to clap for Southern Rays. You might as well clap for the Lord. Amen. Closet Pentecostals, Lord. We're trying to bring them out. Amen. That whosoever believeth in them should not perish. He believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life for God. Say that with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That... I got gotcha. you. 
Did you think that was funny? <laughs> Turkey leg. That for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Give the Lord a hand.